let's, let's look here at chapter number five on page number 104, the nature of real estate. So again, this is a very macro, very broad chapter on page 104, the nature of real estate. Now, candidly, real estate is uh, distinguished from personal property at the very top of page 104. Real estate is distinguished from personal property because personal property, of course, is movable. At its most basic level, personal property is movable, real property is immovable. But regardless of whether you're talking about real or personal property, property itself could best be described as a bundle of rights. So if you look at the top of page 104, you'll see the term bundle of rights. The best definition of property is that it is a bundle of rights. So meaning that you could possess it, top of 104, you could control it, you could enjoy it, you could even exclude others from it, you could dispose of it by sale or by will or by other transfer. So there's all sorts of things that you can do at the top of 104 with real estate, which is why it's a bundle of rights. Real property is a property is a bundle of rights. Now, if you look at the bottom of page 104, you'll see the term land in bold. And next to that, you'll see the word appurtenance. Now, what is an appurtenance on page number 104? Right next to appurtenance, I would write appurtenance dash runs with the land. Anytime you see the word appurtenant or appurtenance on the exam, this is real estate. This is an example of something that runs with the land. Here's an example of this. Let's say you got two properties side by side. We'll call this property A, we'll call that property B. Let's say the only way that B can get home is to cross through A. This is called an easement. You've seen this, where there's like a house on the back. The only way the guy in the back can get home is to cross through the front house. This is an easement. Now, if this property is here in Santa Monica, and you sell it and move to Irvine, do you take that easement with you to Irvine, or does it stay with the property? Stays with the property, right? It's said to be a pertinent to the land on page number 104. So what is an appurtenance? An appurtenance is anything that runs with the land, hence it's real estate. Now at the bottom of 104, real estate is highly durable. I mean, you could have two acres of land in Palm Springs, take a stick of dynamite, blow a hole in it, and it really wouldn't change the land at all. It changed the contour, but the land itself is there forever. Real estate has a characteristic of durability. It's basically indestructible. Real estate has limited supply, also at the bottom of 104. Limited supply, meaning that they're not making any more of it, as they famously say. Now, land is scarce, but frankly, it's not scarce in the aggregate sense. I mean, you might have to, the, the world can, we don't want this necessarily, but the world could probably take a doubling of population and still be okay. There's a lot of, I mean, just think of it in Southern California. If you look at Cucamonga to Victorville to Vegas, I mean, you could put several million people in that. You look at a continent like Australia, the vast majority of Australia is still barren. Africa is the same way. Asia, a lot of, a lot of China is, uh, is the same way. Everybody's just concentrated in certain areas. So real estate has limited supply in some sense. If you look at the bottom of 104, cost factors. Construction technology did not experience the revolutionary breakthroughs that occurred in other trades during the 20th century. There's still relative inefficiency in construction methodology. This is why a lot of economists and a lot of people that are you know, thinking about real estate have a position that if you look 50 to 100 years out, the way buildings and homes are manufactured is gonna be a hell of a lot different than it is today. And there's been a, a big shift even in the mid 1900s. I mean, if you look at the 1800s, how cabins were built, cabins were built with huge, they're not in the balloon frame construction that uh, properties are built in now. The construction techniques, which we'll look, in a, look at in a later chapter, have changed pretty significantly. But you didn't have this huge technological leap in construction like you had in a lot of other industries. So there's a lot of people that think that when property is built, it'll actually be manufactured in pieces somewhere else. They do this now with some property. And it's actually physically brought to the site and assembled on site. And more, manu more, uh, uh, more manufacturing innovation is going to take place in the real estate business is what a lot of people think at the bottom of 104 to reduce cost. If you look at 105, real estate also has a characteristic of, be, of, of heterogeneity. Heterogeneity, of course, refers to uniqueness. No two parcels of real estate are alike. Unlike products of our mechanized society that are produced in a uniform manner, real property has a unique feature, heterogeneity. That is, 
no two parcels are exactly alike. You're going to have variation in topography at the top of 105, the lay of the land. You're going to have variation in proximity to other parcels, improvements. Ingress and egress, access is going to be different with every parcel. Annoyances, parano uh, paranama uh, is going to be different. A view from one property might be more desirable than another, which would cause an increase in value with the view. The nature of real estate at the bottom of 105 is also a very emotional business. Real estate has a large level of emotion surrounding it. So a normal home purchaser, if you're going to buy back your old childhood home, maybe your parents lost a home in foreclosure 40 years ago. Now you have money, you might be willing to overpay because of the emotion attached to that particular parcel of real estate. Now, real estate, frankly, at 106 and 107, real estate is a complex market. Real estate has, it's not simple, it's complicated. There's a lot of different boxes that you could fit in when you say, hey, I'm in real estate. This could mean at the bottom of 106, you're in brokerage, finance, title insurance, pest control, law, property management, appraisal, escrow, all sorts of different paths you could go down at the bottom of 106 because the real estate marketplace is complex. There's people that specialize at the top of 107 and compartmentalize their careers into specific areas. For example, some people might just sell commercial real estate. Some people might just lease commercial real estate. You could be so compartmentalized and focused that all you do is commercial leasing for dentists. That's it. You help place dentists in new labs or in new dental offices. You can make a whole career out of that. Maybe you just sell gas stations, for example, at the top of uh, 107. So real estate has a lot of different paths you could go down. It's complicated. It's not homogeneous. It's heterogeneous. It's different depending on where, uh, where you are. Now, if you look at 108 and 109, some changes, some evolving issues in our real estate business over the last 20 years. One huge change that's come down the pipe is actually not even printed in the book yet because it hasn't even happened yet. The Department of Real Estate in July, as of July 1st of 2013, is going to go away. It's going to be called the Bureau of Real Estate as of July 1st. The Governor Brown had a budget and that budget called for elimination of the Department of Real Estate and it's going to be folded inside of the Department of Consumer Affairs. So that's a change, right, that's going to be happening here in the next uh, few months. If you look at the bottom of 108, the SAFE Act. The SAFE Act basically requires if you are doing mortgage loan origination, if you are a lender, you are going to need an NMLS number. Now NMLS of course stands for National Mortgage Licensing Systems. And NMLS requires that if you're going to be a real estate loan originator, originating loans, you will need an NMLS number, National Mortgage License Systems, under the SAFE Act here at the bottom of page number 108. That's a pretty big change. Back before this passed in the mid-2000s, you know, 2005, 2006, 7, etc., if I was going to do loans under certain structures, there was no licensing required at all. I could go work at a department of corporation shop fresh out of prison and started being a loan originator, getting clients social security numbers, running their credit, looking at their bank statements, crazy. So out of all the madness that happened in our real estate market, lawmakers passed the SAFE Act, which says, okay, look, if you want to be a loan originator, you need to pass a criminal background check, take a 20 hour class, take a test, and make sure that you're qualified to do loans. Every year, if you have an NMLS number under the SAFE Act, you'll need to renew that license with an eight-hour class each and every year. Another change at the bottom of 108 with regard to real estate. Sometimes on page 109, there's tax changes. The ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, some areas have rent control that limit the amount you can rent of, of rental increase that you can have. We have that here in Los Angeles. Uh, Oakland has rent control. Uh, Palm Springs has rent control. A lot of areas where there's a lot of demand, you have rent control to protect their tenants. You'll see this, by the way, at the bottom of page number 110. Since January 1st of 1999, the following communities in California have rent control. Berkeley, Beverly Hills, Palm Springs, San Francisco, Santa Monica, West Hollywood, etc. You have rent control in those areas. Now, most cities at the bottom of 111 and 112, you're going to have growth control no matter what. 
You need to make sure as a city planner or a lawmaker or a person of influence that your city is growing appropriately. You're bringing the right businesses into your city according to your general plan, which we'll talk about later on in this book. But growth control, also called growth management at the bottom of 111, is not a new concept in California. Since the late 1960s, many communities have developed a variety of growth control systems to address environmental, social, and economic problems. This also, in the second to the last paragraph at the bottom of 111, you'll see uh, this NIMBY concept at the bottom of 111. NIMBY, of course, is not in my backyard, meaning most people say, yes, we need to have low-income housing for people that can't afford the median price home. We need low-income housing, just not next to me, right? Not in my backyard. Yes, we need uh, you know, community health facilities for people without health insurance, like, like urgent care for people that are low-income or below the poverty line. Cool, I agree, but just what? Not near me. So this concept of not in my backyard the problems associated with growth are simply passed on to the next community, the one with no growth management regulations. Now, if you look at page number 113, pretty much every city is going to have urban growth boundaries or urban limit lines to make sure that the businesses and proposed uses in the area are in line with the general plan. 